see at the beginning of the bradycardia, the CTG shows accelerations. That means this baby is not doing badly and this baby is likely to recover. So that's the first thing. The second thing you have to examine the clinical picture for the six things I mentioned. Is the IUGR infection, meconium, post-term, preterm, bleeding? Because if those are there, again, the baby can get compromised very quickly with bradycardia. If there are no clinical evidence of compromise or the CTG shows accelerations at the beginning, you can wait. In the olden days, they used to do FBSs, like here they are done 7.18. But if the heart rate returns to normal, once the heart rate washes off the carbon dioxide, the pH will come back to normal. So now the recommendation is not to do pH at the time of bradycardia or even after that. This is actually a study which we did in 1985 in Singapore to show that when there is too many contractions, we are giving um, some terbutaline to get rid of the too many contractions and the bradycardia resolves but at that time we were doing PHS, it's 7.19. The moment the heart rate comes back to normal, it uh, flushes the carbon dioxide and the pH comes back to normal within 20 to 30 minutes. So as you can see, within 30 minutes it's back to normal. So the current recommendation is actually not to do a pH during or after the bradycardia because it's of no value. If you do a pH at the time of bradycardia, and if it continues to be bradycardic, we know that baby is going to get a bad pH with progress of time. And similarly, if it recovers, there's no point doing a pH because it is going to come back to normal very soon. So better not to do any pH. So based on this research, we produce what we call as three, six, nine, and 12 minutes guidance. Three minutes is actually to diagnose bradycardia and exclude abruption, cord prolapse, and scar rupture, because if one of those are there, you have to intervene. Six minutes is, if there is a CTG trace which is abnormal before the bradycardia, or there's a clinical picture which is abnormal, then you have to intervene. And nine minutes is, if there is no problem, no scar rupture, abruption, cord prolapse, no clinical problem, and the CTG was normal, then you can wait up to nine minutes. And if it is not recovering by nine minutes, that means it's showing signs of recovery, then you have to shift her to the theater and uh, do a cesarean section. So this is actually the protocol which we follow in the UK, what we call a three, six, nine minutes, 12 minutes guidance. The clinical picture is important. So this is a woman with uh, previous cesarean scar and uh, suddenly at 1420, there's a drop in the heart rate she is on oxytocin 50 drops per minute, which is 10 milli units. And instead of delivering her, they just try to locate the baby's heart rate. And it is going at a very low rate. And by the time they picked up, this is maternal heart rate, it is 1455. 35 minutes later, and the scar has given way. One doesn't have to worry too much other than just to palpate. If the head was three weeks all the time, now it's five weeks. That means the scar has given way, and they could have diagnosed it clinically. Here's a mother who is coming with holding the tummy, trickling of blood, and she is much in pain. She feels faintish. That's a classical sign of abruption. And here again, they have changed from ultrasound to ECG, as you could see here, and uh, trying to get the heart rate instead of paying attention to the clinical scenario. The mother is holding the tummy and they should intervene. By the time they intervened 20, 30 minutes later, it was a severe abruption uh, and the baby was dead. It was a fresh stillbirth. Only in cases of severe eclampsia, when the mother is having convulsions and there's a bradycardia, you don't rush her to the theater because it's a self-limiting issue. When the mother goes into clonic tonic phase, she doesn't breathe and there's a bradycardia. But when you put her on the side, once she starts breathing, the bradycardia will pick up. Because if you rush her into the theater with a high blood pressure and induce anesthesia, she might run into trouble. So uh, eclampsia, you have to be a little bit careful. So this is a summary of prolonged deceleration. Fetal heart rate less than 80 for more than three minutes. Evade signs of recovery in 90% by six minutes, 95% by nine minutes, provided there is no 
nothing to worry about, then you can wait for nine minutes and plan delivery by 12 minutes. An action to delivery by cesarean section by 50, 15 minutes. So this is actually uh, what is called as a category one cesarean section where there is a prolonged deceleration. So that is one abnormal pattern described in the NICE that is prolonged deceleration of bradycardia. The second one is sinusoidal fetal heart rate pattern, sinusoidal. Sinusoidal is a sinus waveform and uh, that is a description based on the CTG you see, but the original description or what we call as earlier definition was uh, frequency of oscillation, what should be the amplitude and what should be the frequency. And can I have another? You can share, I don't know. So um, the baseline, as you could see, can be swinging along. That was the earlier definition, but now we just take it as the, based on the appearance. But sometimes the sinusoidal area might uh, be interspaced with just a straight line with no variability. So we had to really look at the trace. It might be sinusoidal, straight line, sinusoidal, straight line. That can be with anemia as well. Usually they have tachycardia as well. The reason why we pay emphasis on sinusoidal is because it can be physiological. When the baby is sucking its thumb or smacking his lips at the same time with the baby is anemic. So physiological as well as uh, pathological anemia, pathological sinusoidal. Pathological is usually with severe anemia. We don't know the reason how it produces sinusoidal. The first thing when you see a sinusoidal is ask the question, why should this baby in this mother have anemia? So whether mother has resource sensitization or Kell or Duffy antibodies, they are not good. Easy to remember, Kelly kills and Duffy dies. They are not good antibodies. ABO usually give rise to neonatal jaundice. And Lewis A, Lewis B, and M and N blood group, they don't give rise to in utero problems. And you can generally remember that as Lewis lives. So LMN antibodies are not something to worry about. The other possibility is parvovirus infection. Thank you. The other possibility is parvovirus infection where the mother has fever the previous week with running nose and has occipital pain. Next week comes with absent fetal movements and you scan and the baby's lying at the bottom with the fingers open. That means there's no tone and the baby might have anemia. If you have the capacity to do middle cerebral artery velocity, it will be vastly increased because there's more blood gushing into the brain because of the anemia. You can diagnose that. So, Fetal maternal transfusion is another reason. The baby is leaking its blood into the maternal circulation. You have to do a Kleihauer test. And if she's in labor, if she's ruptured and bleeding, that's the possibility. And if you are in Singapore, Hong Kong, China, alpha thalassemia can give rise to sinusoidal 4G deletion. And they present at 29, 30 weeks with severe preeclampsia. The mother is edematous, high blood pressure, proteinuria, and the baby has ascites. So those are the differential diagnoses, but you have to make what is physiological from pathological. So first thing to do is to ask the mother for fetal movements. If the mother says the baby moved just a half an hour ago, then it is unlikely the baby has suddenly become anemic. You can stimulate fetal movements or acceleration. If you move the baby and the baby shows acceleration and continues to move, that's okay. This word fast means fetal acoustic stimulation test. Uh, electronic larynx, people use after laryngectomy, is modified as a fetal acoustic stimulator. Some people use a bicycle bell, whatever it is. If you can stimulate and bring about accelerations of fetal movement, that's a good sign. Klyhau Betke test, you take maternal blood and send it for detecting fetal cells, and that will tell you where there's a fetal maternal. Betke also said ap test, which is the vaginal blood put into two test tubes. Into one you put saline, one you put into weak acid alkali, and the fetal cells which are nucleated will remain without change of color. Maternal blood will change color, but very rarely we do that because if there is vaginal bleeding and an atypical sinusoidal, you know there's a problem and you have to do ultrasound, as I mentioned, for middle cerebral artery velocity. 
And all anemic babies do not show sinusoidal. That has to be kept in mind. So if you get 100 babies with a hemoglobin of five or six grams, only about 15, 20% will show sinusoidal. Others will show just tachycardia and a straight line with reduced variability. So to remember whether it's physiological or pathological sinusoidal. Typically, the physiological sinusoidal will have minor fluctuations because the brain doesn't have enough oxygen it has very minor fluctuations. A pseudo-sinusoidal pattern will have major fluctuations. So here the baby has gone to sleep with the finger in the mouth and sucking, and if you want to verify, you can do a middle cerebral artery velocity and it'll be increased. So you will be able to detect major sinusoidals are usually physiological. If the baby shows sawtooth type of pattern and then acceleration, the fact the baby shows accelerations the baby is not anemic and the baby can, has enough oxygen to accelerate and there's nothing to worry about. Now here's a case unable to fit into a typical sinusoidal, they are a bit concerned. So I had a look and used the sound stimulus as you can see here. And the moment I used the sound, the baby settled down with accelerations and plenty of fetal movements. So this baby with fetal movements and acceleration can't be anemic, but I could have avoided the stimulation because the mother has been marking fetal movements at the beginning. So if we would have observed that, then this I know is due to physiological 